Chapter 7 of Strange Pages from Family Papers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer Chapter 7 Curious Secrets and now I will unclasp a secret book, And to your quick-conceiving discontent I'll read you matter deep and dangerous. Henry the Fourth, Part One, Act One, Scene Three. The Depository of the Secrets of All the World was the inscription over one of the brazen portals of Fakredin's Valley, reminding us of what Ossian said to Oscar, when he resigned to him the command of the morrow's battle. Be thine the secret hill to-night, referring to the Gaelic custom of the commander of an army retiring to a secret hill the night before a battle to hold communion with the ghosts of departed heroes. But, as it has been often remarked of secrets, both political and social, they are only too frequently made to be revealed, a truth illustrative of Ben Jonson's words in The Case is Unaltered. A secret in his mouth is like a wild bird put into a cage, whose door no sooner opens, but tis out. In family history some of the strangest secrets have related to concealment of birth, many a fraud having been devised to alter or perpetuate the line of issue. Early in the present century, a romantic story which was the subject of conversation in the circles both of London and Paris related to Lady Newborough, who had always considered herself the daughter of Lorenzo Chiappini, former jailer of Modigliana, and subsequently constable at Florence, and of his wife, Vincenzia Diligenti. Possessed in her girlhood of fascinating appearance and charming manners, she came out as a ballet dancer at the principal opera at Florence and one night she so impressed Lord Newborough that, by means of a golden bribe, he had her transferred from the stage to his residence. His conduct towards her was tender and affectionate, and, in spite of the disparity of years, he afterwards married her, introducing her to the London world as Lady Newborough. Some time after her marriage, according to a memoir stated to be written by the fair claimant of the House of Orléans, and printed in Paris before the revolution of 1830, but immediately suppressed, when staying at Siena, she received a posthumous letter from her supposed father, which, from its extraordinary disclosures, threw her into complete bewilderment. It ran as follows. My lady, I have at length reached the term of my days, without having revealed to any one a secret which directly concerns me and yourself. The secret is this. On the day when you were born, of a person whom I cannot name, and who now is in the other world, a male child of mine was also born. I was requested to make an exchange, and considering the state of my finances in those days, I accepted to the often repeated and advantageous proposals, and at that time I adopted you as my daughter, in the same manner as my son was adopted by the other party. I observe that heaven has repaired my faults by placing you in better circumstances than your father, although his rank was somewhat similar. This enables me to end my days with some comfort. Let this serve to extenuate my culpability towards you. I entreat your pardon for my fault. I desire you, if you please, to keep this transaction secret in order that the world shall not have any opportunity to speak of an affair which is now without remedy. This, my letter, you will not receive until after my death. Lorenzo Chiappini After receiving this letter, Lady Newborough sent for Ringrezzi, the confessor of the late jailer, and Fabroni, a confessor of the late Countess Borghi, and was told by the former that, in his opinion, she was the daughter of the Grand Duke Leopold, but the latter disagreed, saying, "'My lady is the daughter of a French lord called Count Joinville, who had considerable property in the Champagne, 
and I entertain no doubt that if your ladyship were to go to that province you would there find valuable documents, which I have been told were there left in the hands of a respectable ecclesiastic. It is further stated that two old sisters of the name of Bandini, who had been born and educated in a house of the Borghis, and been during all their life in the service of that family, informed Lady Newborough, and afterwards in the ecclesiastical court of Faenza, that in the year 1773 they followed their master and mistress to Modigliana, where the latter usually had their summer residence in a chateau belonging to them, that, arriving there, they found a French count, Louis Joinville, and his countess established in the Praetorial Palace. They further affirmed that between the Borghese and this family a very intimate intercourse was soon established, and that they daily interchanged visits. Furthermore, the foreign lord, it is said, was extremely familiar with persons of the lowest rank, and particularly with the jailer, Chiappini, who lived under the same roof. The wives of both were pregnant, and it appeared that they expected their delivery much about the same time. But the Count was tormented with a grievous anxiety. His wife had as yet had no male offspring, and he much feared that they would never be blessed with any. Having communicated his project to the Borghese, he at length made an overture to the jailer, telling him that he apprehended the loss of a very great inheritance, which absolutely depended on the birth of a son, and that he was disposed, in case the Countess gave birth to a daughter, to exchange her for a boy, and that for this exchange he would liberally recompense the father. The man, highly pleased at finding his fortune thus unexpectedly made, immediately accepted the offer, and the bargain was concluded. Immediately after the accouchement of the ladies, one of the Bandinis went to the Praetorial Palace to see the newborn babies, when some women in the house told her that the exchange had already taken place, and Chiappini himself being present confirmed their statement. But as there were several persons in the secret, however solemnly secrecy had been promised, public rumour soon accused the barterers. The Count Louis, fearing the people's indignation, concealed himself in the convent of St. Bernard, at Brisighella. The lady, it is added, departed with her suppositious son, her own daughter being baptised and called Maria Stella Petronilla, and designated as the daughter of Lorenzo Chiappini and Vincenzia Diligenti. Having learnt so much, Lady Newborough, being in Paris in the year 1823, had recourse to a stratagem by which she expected to gain additional information. Accordingly, she inserted in the newspapers that she had been desired by the Countess Pompeo Borghi to discover in France a Count Louis Joinville, who, in the year 1773, was with his Countess at Modigliana, where the latter gave birth to a son on the 16th of April, and that if either of these persons were still alive, or the child born at Modigliana, she was empowered to communicate to them something of the highest importance. Subsequently to this advertisement she was waited upon by Colonel Joinville, but he derived his title only from Louis the Eighteenth. But before the colonel was out of the door, she had a call from the Abbé de saint Phare, whom she gave to understand that she was anxious to discover the identity of a birth connected with the sojourn with the late Comte de Joinville. In the course of conversation, this Abbé is stated to have made most injudicious admissions, from which Lady Newborough gathered that he was the confidential agent of the Duke of Orléans, being currently said to be his illegitimate brother. Lady Newborough was now convinced in her own mind that she was the eldest child of the late Duke of Orléans, and hence was the first princess of the blood of France, and the rightful heiress of immense wealth. But this discovery brought her no happiness, and subjected her to much discomfort and misery. Her story, whether true or false, will in all probability remain a mystery to the end of time, being one of those political puzzles which must remain an open question. Secret intrigue, however, at one time or another, has devised the most subtle plans for supplanting the rightful owner out of his birthright. A second wife, through jealousy, entering into some shameful compact to defraud her husband's child by his former wife of his property in favour of her own. Such a secret conspiracy is connected with Draycott, and, although it has been said to be one of the most mysterious in the whole range of English legends, Yet, singular as the story may be, writes Sir Bernard Burke, No small portion of it is upon record as a thing not to be questioned, 
and it is not necessary to believe in supernatural agency to give all parties credit for having faithfully narrated their impressions. The main facts of this strange story are briefly told. Walter Long of Draycott had two wives, the second being Catherine, daughter of Sir John Tin of Longleat. On their arrival at Draycott, after the honeymoon, there were great rejoicings into which all entered, save the heir to the houses of Draycott and Raxall, who were silent and sad. Once arrived in her new home, the mistress of Draycott lost no time in studying the character of her stepson, for she had an object in view which made it necessary that she should completely understand his character. Her design was, in short, that the young master of Draycott, the heir of all his father's property, the obstruction in the way of whatever children there may be by the second marriage, must be ruined, or at any rate so disgraced, as to provoke his father to disinherit him. Taking into her confidence her brother Sir Egremont Tin of Longleat, with his help she soon discovered that the youthful heir of Draycott was fond of wine and dice, and that he had, on more than one occasion, met with his father's displeasure for indulgence in such acts of dissipation. Having learnt, too, that the young man was kept on short supplies by his parsimonious father, and had often complained that he was not allowed sufficient pocket money for the bare expenses of his daily life, the crafty stepmother seized this opportunity for carrying out her treacherous and dishonourable conduct. Commiserating with the inexperienced youth in his want of money, and making him feel more than ever dissatisfied at his father's meanness to him, she quickly enlisted him on her side, especially when she gave him liberal supplies of money, and recommended him to enjoy his life whilst it was in his power to do so. With a full rather than an empty purse, the young squire was soon seen with a cheerful party over the wine bottle, and at another time with a gambling group gathered round the dice box but this kind of thing suited admirably his stepmother, for she took good care that such excesses were brought under the notice of the lad's father and magnified into heinous crimes. From time to time this unprincipled woman kept supplying the unsuspecting youth with money and did all in her power to encourage him in his tastes for reckless living. Fresh stories of his son's dissipated conduct were continually being told to the master of Draycott, until at last, influenced by the wiles of his charming wife, on the other by deeper wiles of his brother-in-law, he agreed to make out a will, disinheriting his son by his first wife, and settling all his possessions on his second wife and her relations. Hitherto the secret entered into, by brother and sister, had been a perfect success, for not only was the son completely alienated from his father, but the latter deemed it a sin to make any provision for one who was given to drink and gambling. A draft will was drawn up by Sir Egremont Tin, and when approved of, was ordered to be copied by a clerk. But here comes the remarkable part of the tale. The work of engrossing demands a clear, bright light, and the slightest shadow intervening between the light and the parchment would be sure to interrupt operations. Such an interruption the clerk was suddenly subjected to when, on looking up, he beheld a white hand, a lady's delicate white hand, so placed between the light and the deed as to obscure the spot on which he was engaged. The unaccountable hand, however, was gone almost as soon as noticed. The clerk, concluding that this was some optical delusion, proceeded with his work, and had come to the clause wherein the master of Draycott disinherited his son, when again the same ghostly hand was thrust between the light and the parchment. Terrified at this unearthly intervention, the clerk awoke Sir Egremont from his midnight slumbers, and told him what had occurred, adding that the spectre hand was no other than that of the first wife of the master of Draycott, who resented the cruel wrong done to her son. In due time, the deed was engrossed by another clerk, and duly signed and sealed. But the white hand had not appeared in vain, for the clerk's curious adventure afterwards, 
became the topic of general conversation, and the injustice done to the disinherited heir of Draycott excited so much sympathetic indignation that the trustees of the late Lady Long arrested the old knight's corpse at the church door. Her nearest relations commenced a suit against the intended heir, and the result was a compromise between the parties, John Long taking possession of Roxall, while his other half-brother was allowed to retain Draycott, a settlement that, it is said, explains the division of the two estates, which we find at the present day. The secret between the brother and sister was well kept, and whatever explanation may be given to the white hand, the story is as singular as any in the annals of domestic history. It was the betrayal of a secret, on the other hand, on the part of a woman, that is traditionally said to have caused the sudden and tragic death of Richard, second Earl of Scarborough. This nobleman, it seems, was in the confidence of the King, and had been entrusted by him with the keeping of a most important secret. But, like most other favourites, the Earl was surrounded by enemies who were ever on the alert to compass his ruin, and, amidst other devices, they laid their plans to prevail on the unsuspecting Earl to betray the confidence which the King had implicitly reposed on him. Finding it, however, impossible by this means to make him guilty of a breach of trust towards the King, they had recourse to another scheme which proved successful, and thereby irrevocably compromised him in the King's eyes. Having discovered that the Earl was in love with a certain lady, and was in the habit of frequently visiting her, some of his enemies discovered where she lived, and, calling on her, promised an exceeding rich reward, if she could draw the royal secret from her lover and communicate it to them. Easily bought over by the offer of so rich a bribe, the treacherous woman, like Delilah of old, soon prevailed upon the Earl to give her the desired information, and the secret was revealed. As soon as the Earl's enemies were apprised of the same, they lost no time in hurrying to the King, and submitting to him the proofs of his protégé's imprudence. They gained their end, for the next time the Earl came into the royal presence, the King said to him, in a sad but firm voice, Lumley, you have lost a friend, and I a good servant. This was a bitter shock to the Earl, for he learnt now, for the first time, that she, in whom he had reposed his love and faith, had been his worst enemy, and that, as far as his relations to the King were concerned, he was disgraced as a man of honour in his estimation. With his proud and haughty spirit, unable to bear the misery and chagrin of his fall and ruin, he had recourse to the suicide's escape from trouble. He shot himself. But another secret, no less tragic, and of a far more sensational nature, related to a certain Mr. Macfarlane. One Sunday in the autumn of the year 1719, Sir John Swinton of Swinton in Berwickshire left his little daughter Margaret, who had been indisposed through a childish ailment, at home when he went with the rest of his family to church, taking care to lock the outer door. After the lapse of an hour or so, the child had become dull through being alone, and she made her way into the parlour below stairs, where on her arrival she hastily bolted the door to keep out any ghost or bogey, stories relating to which had oftentimes excited her fears. But great was her terror when, on looking round, she was confronted by a tall lady, gracefully attired, and possessed of remarkable handsome features. The poor child stood motionless with terror, afraid to go forwards or backwards. Her throbbing heart, however, quickly recovered from its fright, as the mysterious lady, with a kind eye and sweet smile, addressed her by name, and taking her hand, spoke, "'Margaret, you may tell your mother what you have seen, but for your life to no one else. If you do, much evil may come of it, some of which will fall on yourself. You are young, but you must promise to be silent as the grave itself in this matter.' 
Full of childish wonderment, Margaret, half in shyness and half in fear at being an agent in so strange a secret, turned her head towards the window, but on turning round found the lady had disappeared, although the door remained bolted. Her curiosity was now more than before aroused, and she concluded that after all this lady must be one of those fairies she had often read of in books, and it was whilst pondering on what she had seen that the family returned from church. Surprised at finding Margaret bolted in this parlour, Sir John learnt that she had been frightened, she knew not why, at the solitude of her own room, and had bolted herself in the parlour. Although she was soon laughed out of her childish fears, Lady Swinton was quick enough to perceive that Margaret had not communicated everything, and insisted upon knowing the whole truth. The child made no objection, as she had not been told to keep the secret from her mother. After describing all that happened, Lady Swinton kissed her daughter tenderly and said, Since you have kept the secret so well, you shall know something more of this strange lady. Thereupon Lady Swinton pushed aside one of the oaken panels in the parlour, which revealed a small room beyond, where sat the mysterious lady. "'And now, Margaret, dear,' said her mother, "'listen to me. This lady is persecuted by cruel men, who, if they find her, will certainly take her life. She is my guest, she is now yours, and I am sure I need not tell you the meanest peasant in all Scotland would shame to betray his guest.' Margaret promised to keep the secret, never evincing the slightest curiosity to know who the lady was, and it is said she had reached her twentieth year when one day the adventure of her childhood was explained. It seems that the lady in question was a Mrs. Macfarlane, daughter of Colonel Charles Straton, a zealous Jacobite. When about nineteen years old she married John Macfarlane, law agent of Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, who was many years her senior. Soon after her marriage, Mrs. Macfarlane made the acquaintance of Captain John Cayley, a commissioner of customs, and on September the 29th, 1716, he called on her at Edinburgh, when, for reasons only known to herself or him, she fired two shots at him with a pistol, one of which pierced his heart. According to Sir Bernard Burke, it was when she would not yield to Captain Cayley's immoral overtures that the latter vowed to blacken her character, a threat which he so successfully carried out that not one of her female acquaintances upon whom she called would admit her, not one of all she met in the street would acknowledge her. Desperate at this villainy on his part, Mrs. Macfarlane, under pretence of agreeing to Captain Cayley's overtures, sent for him, when, fully confident that he was about to reap the fruit of his infamous daring, he obeyed her summons. But no sooner had he entered the room than she locked the door, and, snatching up a brace of pistols, she exclaimed, "'Wretch! You have blasted the reputation of a woman who never did you the slightest wrong. You have fixed an indelible stain upon the child at her bosom, and all this because, coward as you are, you thought that there was no one to take her part. At the same time, it is said, she fired two shots at him with a pistol, one of which pierced his heart. Her husband asserted, however, that she fired to save herself from outrage, an explanation which she affirmed was only too true. Her husband also declared that his wife was desirous of sending for a magistrate and of telling him the whole story, but that he advised her against it. But not appearing to stand her trial in the ensuing February, she was outlawed, and obtained refuge in the mansion house of the Swinton family in the concealed apartment already described. According to Sir Walter Scott, she returned and lived and died in Edinburgh. But her life must have been comparatively short, as her husband married again on October the 6th, 1719. 
Akin to this dramatic episode may be mentioned one concerning Robert Percival, the second son of the Right Honourable Sir John Percival, when reading for the law in his chambers in Lincoln's Inn. The clock had just struck the hour of midnight, when, on looking up from his book, he was astonished to see a figure standing between himself and the door, completely muffled up in a long cloak so as to defy recognition. "'Who are you?' but the figure made no answer. "'What do you want?' No reply. The figure stood motionless. Thinking it made a low, hollow laugh, the young student struck at the intruder with his sword, but the weapon met with no resistance, and not a single drop of blood stained it. This was amazing, and still no answer. Determined to solve the mystery of this strange being, he cast aside his cloak, when, lo, he saw his own apparition, bloody and ghostly, whereat he was so astonished that he immediately swooned away, but recovering, he saw the spectre depart. At first this occurrence left the most unpleasant impressions on his mind, but as days passed by without anything happening, the warning, or whatever it was, faded gradually from his memory, and he lived as before, drinking and quarrelling, managing to embroil himself at play with the celebrated Bow Fielding. The day at last came, however, when his equanimity was disturbed, for, as he was walking from his chambers in Lincoln's Inn to a favourite tavern in the Strand, he imagined that he was followed by an ungainly-looking man. He tried to avoid him, but the man followed on, and after a time, fully convinced that he was dogged by this man, he demanded who he was and why he followed him. But the man replied, I am not following you, I am following my own business. By no means satisfied, young Percival crossed over to the opposite side of the street, but the man followed him step by step, and before many minutes had elapsed he was joined by another man, as ungainly looking as himself. Percival, no longer doubting that he was followed, called upon the two men to retire at their peril, and although he succeeded in making them take to their heels after a sharp sword skirmish, he was himself wounded in the leg, and made his way to the nearest tavern. This unpleasant encounter, reviving the memory of the ghastly figure he had seen in his chambers, made him feel that he was a doomed man. And he was not far wrong, for that night, near the so-called Maypole in the Strand, he was found dead. But how he died was a secret never divulged. Another equally strange incident connected with this mysterious crime happened to a Mrs. Brown perhaps from her holding some situation in the family of his uncle, Sir Robert. On this fatal night, writes Sir Bernard Burke, she dreamt that one Mrs. Shearman, the housekeeper, came to her and asked for a sheet. She demanded, for what purpose? To which Mrs. Shearman replied, poor Master Robert is killed, and it is to wind him in. Curious to say, in the morning, Mrs. Shearman came at an early hour into her room and asked for a sheet. For what purpose? inquired Mrs. Brown. Poor Mr. Robert is murdered, was the reply. He lies dead in the Strand Watch House, and it is to wind his body in. In the year 1848, the Warwick magistrates investigated a most extraordinary and preposterous charge of murder against Lord Lee his deceased mother, and persons employed by them, in the course of which inquiry one of the accusers professed to have been in possession of a secret connected with the matter for a number of years. The accusation seems to have originated from the attempt of certain parties to seize Stoneley Abbey on the pretense that it rightfully belonged to them and not Lord Lee. In November 1844 a mob took possession of the place for one George Lee, several of the ringleaders were tried for the offence, and not fewer than twenty-eight were convicted. The account of this curious conspiracy, as given in the annual register, goes on to say that Richard Barnett made the charge of murder. In 1814 he was employed under Lady Julia Lee and her son at the Abbey, 
where a number of workmen were engaged in making alterations. Four of these men were murdered by large stones having been allowed to fall on them, and their bodies were placed within an abutment of a bridge, and then enclosed with masonry. Another man was shot by Hay, a keeper. In cross-examination, the witness said he had kept silence on these atrocities for thirty years, because he feared Lord Lee, and because he did not expect to obtain anything by speaking. He first divulged the secret to those who were trying to seize the estate, as this information he thought would help them to get it, for the murders were committed to keep out the proper owners. In the course of the inquiry, John Wilcox was required to repeat evidence which he had given before a master of chancery. But instead of doing so, the man confessed that he was not sober when he made the declaration. He further declared how some servants of the Lee family had burned pictures and had been paid to keep the secrets of the house. The whole story, however, was a deliberate and willful fabrication. The facts were contradicted and circumstantially refuted, and of course so worthless a charge was dismissed by the bench. End of chapter 7